aquarium lighting. It's a bit of a complicated topic when you start to look into the technicals of it. We use all sorts of really technical terms to describe what lighting does and to compare one light to another. Things like Kelvin and CRI and Watts and Lumens and PAR and PER. Believe me, I'm not talking about the sound a cat makes when you pet it. These are specs that we use to measure what a light can do, what type of light it provides, and there are ways to differentiate one light between another. But as an aquarium hobbyist, which of these do you actually need to care about when you're selecting a light and which of them can you just completely forget about? Today, I aim to tell you which are important and I aim to break down each and every one of these specs in a way that's actually easy to understand in layman's terms. Because regardless of whether or not you use all these specs when selecting a light, I think as a hobbyist, it's cool to understand what they actually mean. So when you see the marketing and when you see the back of the box on a light, you actually know what you're looking at. So let's dive right into the topic, which is accordion lighting. So let's talk about a few of the different lights available on the market, and then we'll discuss which one is the most popular in the hobby today. So you may have heard these terms before, but you've got things like fluorescent and metal halide and incandescent, and then finally LED. And LED, as you probably know, is the most popular type of aquarium lighting on the market today, and that's for a few simple reasons. Number one, an LED light can produce the same amount of light as say a fluorescent or an incandescent for far less power. So it's gonna be a lot more energy efficient, which is good for everybody. It's good for your wallet and it's good for the environment. So that's what you'll primarily see on the market today from the big manufacturers. And they only get cheaper and cheaper as they get easier to manufacture. So we're gonna focus on LED lighting, which stands for light emitting diode today, because that tends to be what most aquascaping and aquarium hobbyists are using today. So let's dive right into LED and talk about all the different specs that you can use to break down how the lighting works. So when you're purchasing a light for the first time, on the back of the box or on the website, you'll most likely see something that looks like the nutrition facts of the light. And these have all the different specs listed on them. So one of the first ones you might see is the power consumption or the wattage. And this basically tells you how much energy it takes to run the light and produce the amount of light that you're seeing. So as I previously mentioned, the LEDs are remarkably energy efficient. So they take far less wattage than something like a fluorescent or a metal halide to output the same amount of light. Why is that important? Well, at one point in the hobby, it was widely regarded that wattage was a good way of measuring how effective a light is. And there was even something called the watts per liters or the watts per gallon way of measuring the effectiveness of your light. However, this isn't really a good way to look at lighting for multiple reasons. Number one, Lighting doesn't operate the same way as say fertilizer. You know, you're not dissolving it into the water homogeneously. There's not equal amounts of light dissolved into your water at the lowest point on the substrate versus, you know, the top where the epiphytes are. Instead, light sort of dissolves via the inverse square law. So as it hits the water, it gets weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker and spreads. So it's a little bit more complicated than that. So the whole watts per gallon thing, it's just outdated, but if you're comparing the wattage or the power consumption of two sort of equally sized, equally priced lights that are both LED, it might be a good benchmark to get started, but it's far from the end all be all that we once thought it was for measuring the effectiveness of a light. And that takes us to the topic of lumens. So lumens are the output of the light, how bright the light actually is. And to give you an example, if light B has twice as many lumens as light A, it's gonna to appear to your eye twice as bright as the lower lumen light. So it's just a way of measuring the output of the light. So as we discussed earlier, the wattage is the power it takes to output a certain amount of lumens. And if you take how many lumens is produced per watt, that's how you get your efficiency. And like we said before, LEDs are incredibly efficient. So are lumens a good way or not to measure the effectiveness of your light? Well, not really. 
But again, it provides an okay benchmark, which is important when selecting a light. You want something that's really bright and you know illuminates the aquascape or the aquarium in a way that you can enjoy it. And if something is really dim, you know, you're gonna have to either buy multiple lights or put it really close. So it's a good way of sort of getting a benchmark of how it's gonna light up your space. But again, Lighting is a lot more complicated than that. Brightness is not the only thing that matters to a plant. In fact, it doesn't matter nearly as much as what the light is composed of. And that's what we're gonna get into next because plants are interesting. They take very specific parts of light and use it to photosynthesize and create new tissue and to grow and to reproduce. So it's very important that the light has very specific wavelengths. And that's what we're gonna get into next. And that brings us to the topic of PAR, which stands for photosynthetically active radiation. And the first time I heard that term, I was like, whoa, that's a mouthful. I don't know what that means. But look, if you actually break it down into its words, it's not that complicated. So let's do that right now. Let's break it down. Photosynthetically, well, that sounds easy enough. We know that photosynthesis is the process by which plants create new tissue and they grow and they reproduce using light as a source. They use the light and they use carbon and they use oxygen and they use water to create carbohydrates, which allows them to grow and light powers that process. So that's easy enough, photosynthesis. Active radiation. Whoa, radiation, that sounds scary. Well, actually, I know it has a negative connotation in sort of the human world, but radiation really just means any source of energy that something outputs that travels at the speed of light. So all the lights in your home are outputting radiation because they're outputting lumens that are traveling at the speed of light and are visible to your eye. So that's what that means. It means the energy that a light puts out that is usable by the plant. They only use light in the 400 nanometer to the 700 nanometer spectrum of visible light. So let's talk a little bit about what that wavelength encompasses. So the 400 nanometer to the 700 nanometer wavelength basically encompasses red light, it encompasses green light, and encompasses blue light. And plants mostly use red light and they mostly use blue light and they use a little bit of green light, but they mostly reflect it and don't absorb it. And that's why to your eye, plants look green because they're reflecting the green light. So given that, it's very important that the light you're using is primarily composed of lighting within that red, green, and blue spectrum. And there are things called PAR meters that sort of receive the light and they tell you how many micromoles are hitting that surface. So PAR is a good start for getting a more accurate read on how effective your light actually is for growing plants. And we can use PAR measurements, which again are micromoles, to to sort of get a gauge of how it's gonna grow plants because we have some recommendations that are sort of accepted by the community. And those are the following. For low light, sort of low demanding shade plants, we recommend that they get hit with a par of about 30 micromoles. And then for medium light plants, ones that aren't hanging out in the shade so much and aren't super fast growers, but grow a lot faster than your microsorums and your epiphytes, we recommend about 50 micromoles. And then for your fast growing plants, like your stems and your really vibrant colors, the ones you wanna grow and trim regularly, we recommend a par of 90 plus micromoles for those plants. So there are some variations to this, but that's a good benchmark to sort of, uh, you know, get you going. And again, light is very different than a fertilizer. It doesn't dissolve homogeneously in your tank. So you have to take a close look at PAR readings because the PAR is gonna be really high when it first enters the tank at the top and then it sort of exponentially gets lower and lower because of the inverse square law. So certain manufacturers will provide PAR data and you can scour the forums to see, you know, what kind of PAR readings a given light is providing at different depths of the aquarium. But most of the manufacturers these days will tell you, hey, this light is good for a 60p or this light is good for a 45p, or this light is good for like a little four gallon cube garden. So I would have used that above all else, but you know, the PAR light outputs can be used once again to compare one light to another. But here's where it gets even more complicated. We got the cat part of it, the purr. And again, it's not the noise a cat makes, it is photosynthetically usable radiation. So let's talk about that for a second.
So we discussed earlier that plants use light that comes in at the 400 to the 700 nanometer wavelengths. But here's the thing about plants, they don't favor all of that light equally. In fact, they really favor the red and they favor the blue the second amount. The green light that hits them sort of is reflected as opposed to being absorbed like the reds and the blues. So PER is a way of measuring what percentage of the PAR that is hitting a surface is actually usable by a certain organism. And that's gonna vary individually by each species you're looking at. It's different for corals. Corals primarily want blues. It's different for aquarium plants. They primarily want reds. So the PER is what percentage for that specific organism is gonna be usable by that plant. And again, it's gonna vary for each species. So it's a really difficult thing to measure because first of all, hobbyists don't have access to any sort of affordable equipment that can really measure this accurately. So to sum up, PER is a way of thinking what percent of the PAR that is hitting the plant is actually gonna be used to make more plant and for that plant to reproduce and grow. And next up we have color temperature, which I think is one of the most important stats to consider. So color temperature is measured using the Kelvin scale, which ranges from 1000 to 10,000. And it's basically the look and the feel of the light. So the lower you get on the Kelvin scale, the warmer the light is gonna be. And by warm, we mean orangey. It's gonna have a orangey red glow to it. If you've ever seen like an old school filament bulb, those are usually tungsten balanced. So they're very warm and orangey. And that's kind of like a cozy vibe. And then if you have something on the really high end towards that 10,000, it's gonna be really blue. We call that cool lighting. And then somewhere in the middle is where sunlight comes in. We call that daylight, which is at about 6,500 Kelvin. So most of the aquarium lights in the market today exist around that daylight. So you really want something that's between the 5,000 and like the 6,800 spectrum of the Kelvin scale, because that's gonna most closely mimic daylight and it's gonna be really pleasing to the eye. So the lower you get on the Kelvin scale, it'll be a little bit warmer, you know, like we described earlier, more of an orangey tint. And if you go higher on that Kelvin scale, more towards the 10,000, so the upper end of that, you know, 6,800 spectrum, it's gonna look a little bit cooler. And that just comes down to preference. So take a look at what the light looks like, compare it to others, try and find videos where you know, somebody shoots both lights with the same camera and see what kind of fits your style better. And finally, we have something called CRI or Color Rendering Index. And this exists on a scale from zero to 100. And basically what it does is it tells you how accurately the light will render colors using daylight as a reference. So to put it in perspective, uh, let's take an apple that you go out in the sun, 6,500 Kelvin lighting, you say, okay, that's what an apple looks like. That's what the red looks like. And then depending on the CRI value of your light, they will either render that out accurately, so it will look the same, or it will look much more faded and less vibrant. So a CRI that is above 80 is considered good. A CRI between 90 and 100 is considered excellent. So you'll get very accurate colors with CRI in the 90 to 100 range. Below 80, you could be getting into a little bit trouble. And if you're buying, you know, budget lighting off of Amazon, or if you're doing some DIY work, this is where you may want to take a look at the CRI and make sure it's not a super low level, or you might get like really faded, inaccurate colors. Whew, so that was a mouthful and we talked about a lot of different specs, but I hope sort of breaking down each and every one of those helps you further understand lighting and what the specs actually mean so that next time you go to buy something, it doesn't all seem like marketing and technical jargon. And you actually know what you're looking at because I think as hobbyists, it's really important to get into these things and at least have a cursory understanding of what they mean. So I hope this video helped with that, but here's the important part and here's why you stuck along the whole time. I'm gonna tell you what you actually have to care about and what you can kind of disregard and not really pay attention to. So in my opinion, the most important thing to look for when buying a new light 
is the social proof. What does that mean? Well, social proof is who is using the lights that you're interested in and what are they doing with it? What do their plants look like? How are their plants growing? What quality of plant health do they produce with a given light? With things like Instagram and YouTube, you can go check out a popular light that maybe you're interested in and see what the reds are looking like, see what the greens are looking like, see how fast they're able to grow stems, see how vibrant and clean their tanks are. That would be the first thing look out for, so social proof. And then number two, I would say the Kelvin rating would be the second most important thing you wanna look at because it comes down to preference because like we said, Kelvin is the look and the feel of your light. So find a Kelvin value that fits the vibe of your living space, find something that everybody in your household is gonna enjoy, and uh, yeah, make a decision based on that. And finally, if you had to consider one of the more technical specs, I would probably look at PAR. Again, it's not the end all be all because you could have very high PAR values that are mostly green light. But if you know you have two different lights that grow plants great, they're manufactured for aquarium lights, and believe me, the manufacturers are optimizing the wavelengths for plants these days, you can look at the PAR values and then compare prices. So let's say light B has you know 50% more PAR than light A, but light A is you know, half the price. That's something to consider. So you can sort of look at the par per dollar value in that sense. And as long as they're you know, commercially available lights that are from popular brands, you really can't make a wrong choice. A few years ago, you really had to scour for quality lighting. But these days, there's a bunch of different brands that put out lighting for all different sorts of budgets. And as long as they grow plants well, Make the decision from there because budget is really important. You know, you wanna get something that you can afford, that you're happy with. So social proof, budget, Kelvin rating, and then finally take a look at par values to make a final decision. So that's been a lot for today. Thank you so much for sticking around to the end. If you like these types of videos, go ahead and hit subscribe because I plan on doing a lot more deep dives in the future. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.